Okay, folks, we are going live here. I'm going to go ahead and just kind of get us settled in. I think we've got the screen share now up and running. I want to go ahead and share my screen there. Folks, if you could let me know in the chat function here, if you're able to see my screen, it should say growing huge garlic. And if you can hear me, of course, well, then that answers the question. Um, that you're able to hear me because you wouldn't have heard the first part. Anywho, let me know when you're able to see uh, my screen there. Again, it should say growing huge garlic. Nadine, let's get growing. All right, Ian, we got some tips for you this evening, Ian. I got a lot of fun stuff. Ava, great to have you. And you're down in Ladner. You've got like some of the best garlic growing space in Canada, potentially all of North America. Jason and Colleen are here. Jason, Tuesday wasn't enough for you. You had to come back for another one. I love it. Awesome. Well, it looks like everything is up and running. You guys can hear me. We are going to go ahead and start diving straight in. I'm super excited for everything that we're going to be walking through uh, as there's a lot and a lot of just really exciting and cool little tidbits of information that I have for you. So as we begin kind of just getting started and diving in here, a couple of housekeeping items that I always like to cover off on is first and foremost, any questions that you have over the course of the session, we're going to have those firing into the chat function here. I can see a lot of people already know where the chat function is, but just to make sure that everybody knows where it is, how to utilize it, go ahead and share in the chat function. What year of growing garlic is this for you? Is this year number one? two, three, four, 40. Let us know how many years you've been growing garlic for in the chat function here. And if you don't have access to the chat function, there's a little uh, button that says sign in on the top right hand corner. You just need to quickly sign into Google and then you're able to participate in the chat function there. Next piece is that it's been a moment since we've done a happy hour. I know we've been busy over the course of the summer, but I do have the happy hour shirt on. We're going to have a heck of a lot of fun here this evening. So go ahead and get yourself a drink and a snack, whether that's a beer or a wine, a coffee, tea, water, mocktail, anything in between. Grab your favorite snack and sit somewhere else to where you work over the course of the week here. Really want you kicking back and relaxing, switching out of being in work mode and into just rest and relaxation. All right, Donna's in year one of growing garlic. Steve's year one. Deanna is in year 20. I'm gonna be reaching out to you afterwards for some tips potentially to hear what you've learned over those 20 years. Ian, year nine. Wandy, year one. I love it, amazing. So as a couple more folks join us on this session here, um, we did do something two days ago and that was our garlic kit giveaway. So we sent an email out to everybody that had RSVP'd by Tuesday, Sharon to invite a friend and the two of you could be entered to win two of our garlic kits. And so I am absolutely thrilled to share that the winner of our garlic kits are Carl and Sadie E. Sadie, thank you for bringing Carl. Carl, great to have you. Thank you everybody for inviting your friends. I think there were about 190 to 200 folks that were invited there. And for Carl and for Sadie, we're gonna get those garlic kits shipped out to you beginning of next week. Mike, he's in the chat function. He's going to reach out to the two of you to get um, your shipping information and details so that we can get those out to you. But let's start kind of cooking here, folks. And so for those of you that might be on your first happy hour with us here, I'm Jordan from Mind and Soil. And I started Mind and Soil about 18 months ago to help introduce a million individuals to gardening's mental health benefits. So this evening, we're going to talk a lot about garlic. I'm really going to do everything I can to try and help you grow amazing garlic. And my hope with this is that we take as much of the guesswork out of how to go about growing really beautiful garlic so that you can be spending all of your time in the garden connecting with just how peaceful, how calming, and how soothing it is. But when this evening comes to an end, I want to still be supporting you. And so right below the video here, there should be a little red button that says subscribe. And I really encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel here because we put out new videos every single week at all the key moments through the gardening season to lend a hand any way that we can. And if you ever have a question over the course of the gardening season, just leave that as a comment on any one of the 150 plus videos on our YouTube channel. And you'll get a response literally from 
from me within 24 hours. I dare you to try it. You'll see how quick I am on the responses, but that is because again, I wanna be taking as much of the guesswork out of gardening as possible. So you all can just be feeling how amazing it is as I have. Now this evening, the happy hour is brought to us by our friends at West Coast Seeds and we are joined by the amazing Mandy Moon. She's the farm assistant over there, basically running the whole farm operation this season. And she's also gonna be in the chat function answering a whole bunch of questions as we go. So I'm gonna pass it over to Mandy here to let her do a quick little introduction. And also Mandy, I'm really curious to hear what your favorite type of garlic to grow is. Love it. And I know we're having a couple of audio uh, issues there um, with the, the audio there, Maddie. I think maybe you've got the background sound from the, the live stream going, but we should be all good on that front. And uh, yeah, for those of you that, that may not have caught it there from Mandy, favorite garlic is Red Russian. And she has really been taking care of all of the seeds, the seedlings out there on the farm at West Coast Seeds. So um, when it comes to like gardening experience, she's literally starting tens of thousands of seeds and growing them. So as we go through things this evening here, go ahead and type your uh, questions into the chat and she'll be in the chat function there answering a whole bunch of those. And so what we're going to do here is begin diving in. And you know, folks, how I always like to kick this off is that if you are all set and ready for a whole bunch of garlic tips here, then go ahead and type into the chat function, let's grow. Let's grow into the chat function. We're gonna begin diving in. As those begin to roll through, I actually wanna take us back a year, especially for those of you that are on the newer side to growing garlic, because 12 months ago, we hosted a happy hour just like this. And at that point in time, I was kind of thinking, look, I just came off of this amazing crop of garlic. Here's just one of the red Russian heads that I grew and how much large it was than what I found in the store. And so I figured, hey, I'm just going to do it a happy hour and share all the tips and learnings that I can with folks to try and lend a hand and help out any way that I can. So we did the happy hour, had tons of folks join just like this evening. And then it's kind of like, you know, garlic, you get into the ground and then you find out how it did nine, 10 months later. And so in June, I still wasn't quite sure how everybody had done with their garlic. But then in July and in August, folks, all of these images started coming into my inbox from individuals that attended the exact same happy hour last year. Kathy with a literal wheelbarrow full of red Russian garlic. Mike with beautiful heads of garlic there down in North Vancouver. Amy with, I don't even know how many heads of garlic she got there. And Christina, what she had to share. Last October, I planted the garlic received from Jordan. A few days ago, I harvested the 13 bulbs, which resulted, I am proud of myself and will replant double this fall with the largest cloves. Where I am from, which is Transylvania, we always braid the garlic and hang it to chase away the vampires. This year, there's just one rope, not perfectly braided as I'm still a beginner, but wait until next year. I actually wanted to thank you, Jordan, for all that you do. Thank you. So folks, every single one of you that are on this happy hour this evening is going to have all the information that you need to get garlic going like this, this coming year. I can see Anna saying, let's grow. Deanna saying, let's grow. And so the way that we're going to run through this session here is we're going to break it down into three key chunks. First, what do we need to do in the fall to grow amazing garlic? Next, what do we need to do in the spring to grow amazing garlic? And lastly, how do we go about harvesting in the summertime? And the first piece that we're gonna be touching on is all around the fall. And so folks, when it comes to growing garlic, what I would say is that like 80% of how your crop does 
happens in the fall and how we get it into the ground. And so the next kind of like 15 to 20 minutes of our happy hour here, it's going to be a good amount of information, but this is where like, let's really focus in for this first portion because then the spring and the summer, it is just a breeze as they grow and then ultimately get ready to harvest it. So diving in with what do we need to do in the fall? The very first place that we want to get started is with choosing your variety. And so when it comes to garlic and really all plants for that matter, right? If we were to think about tomato or basil or onions, there's multiple varieties within each of those vegetables. And it's no different with garlic. There's a number of different varieties. And with garlic, it really breaks down into two families. We've either got hard neck garlic or we've got soft neck garlic. And there's really like only a few differences between the two of them. But the one really critical differentiating piece of information between these is that hard neck garlic is best in colder climates while soft neck garlic is primarily grown in warmer climates. So I'm not sure where everybody is located for this happy hour. Feel free to share that in the chat function. But if any of you are down somewhere in the Southern US in California on the Eastern side, then a soft neck variety is probably what you want to be going with. And then for any of our folks across Canada or the Northern parts of the US or throughout Europe, and you're in zone eight or below, then hard neck garlic is going to be the one that you want to be growing with. And so what are the varieties in each of those areas? Well, with our uh, soft necks, those would be something like California early, silver rose and silver white. And then for our hard neck varieties, a few of the most popular ones are chestnut, are majestic, and then the crown jewel of them all, red Russian garlic. If you told me that there was a bulb of red Russian garlic at the bottom of the Atlantic, buried somewhere in the Titanic, I would put on my swimmers, swan dive off the back of that boat and start diving down to get that red Russian garlic because it is just so wonderful. So a lot of folks across Canada absolutely love their red Russian garlic for a couple of reasons super, super hardy. So when it gets to like negative 15, negative 20 Celsius, this garlic is still okay. It is hardy to negative 30 Celsius. And then once we harvest it in that summer period, the flavor on them is absolutely incredible. And then the last piece is that they store for a really, really long period of time. So if you're like, say, Amy, a little bit earlier on, then you're going to be able to have all of those heads of garlic for six, seven, eight, nine months in storage. So red Russian garlic is um, the thing that I grow exclusively in my backyard at the moment as a result of that. And so now that we know kind of a little bit in terms of what varieties that we want to be going with, there's actually a piece of information that I discovered this year that's even more important. And that is the size of the cloves that we plant. And so folks, one thing that you're going to notice as we go through this happy hour here is that I am like your test guinea pig. I absolutely love running experiments to see what helps plants grow to their best and then share all of those learnings with you to kind of save you one, two, three, four years of trial and error on your own. And so last year at this time, I was wondering like how much of an impact does the size of the garlic clove have on how big the head develops to. So what did I do? I designed a little experiment. I found my 15 smallest cloves and I found my 15 largest cloves and I planted each of those 15 cloves in a line, one line of the smallest cloves, one line of the largest cloves in the same bed. And everything else I did 100% the exact same. We're gonna talk about those pieces over the course of the happy hour, but for right now, every variable was the exact same. The only difference was that one was a small clove, the other one was a large clove. And so then I had to wait nine, 10 months until end of July this season to harvest them when I was gonna be able to see how big of an impact did it actually have. And so take a look at this. I harvested all of the heads of garlic with the 15 smallest cloves that resulted in 438 grams of garlic. Nice heads of garlic in there, good in the kitchen, but when we then grabbed our 15 largest cloves, I mean, just look at them overflowing that bowl that I have on the scale there, 1.65 kilograms, 1,065 grams there. And so when we look at that on a graph here, that means that just simply by doing one thing differently, which was planting larger cloves, 
we're able to get two and a half times larger the yield of garlic that we plant. So if there's one thing that you kind of take from that first part, a red Russian garlic is amazing. And then the bigger the clove that you plant, the best that you're kind of setting yourself up for success when it comes to getting amazing heads of garlic. This was an absolute kind of like aha light bulb moment for me. And so as a result of that, this year with our garlic kits, you actually have the option to buy a add-on of 10 jumbo cloves. And last night I literally was in my garage going through 150 heads of garlic. You can see them all right here, right here to find the absolute biggest cloves of garlic that I could. And just take a look at like the size of that one right there. That's one clove of garlic. And so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But once again, wanna be making it as easy as possible for you to be getting those huge heads of garlic there. And so with that now kind of like nailed down, we're getting our big cloves of garlic into the ground. The next thing that we need to begin thinking through is where in the garden do we plant our garlic? Does it like a lot of sun, not a lot of sun? What's best when it comes to growing garlic? And so when it comes to growing garlic, the location that we want to put them in in the garden is one where it gets lots and lots of sun. And so with that, the kind of first year that I lived here in my house in Squamish, once again, I really encourage you to um, learn from my mistakes and my learnings over the course of the year here. And I bought my house in July, was moving in all of July, all of August, all of September. And then I got to October, I was like, I gotta get my garlic in the ground, but really hadn't looked at the garden too much yet. I threw it into the ground only to then realize that I planted it all in this area right here. And just how my house is situated, that area basically gets shade all year long. So not a good place once so ever. But once again, I learned from that. And I was like, okay, I need to get my garlic into an area that has much more sun. So once again, just based on how my house is located, the bed right next door ends up actually getting really, really amazing sun. And so I planted all of my garlic in that bed and I've been planting in that, gar in that bed every single season since then. And so now the harvests that are coming out of my backyard there are looking like this. And what's important to note on this front is that that isn't even a technically full sun bed. If we were to say that eight hours is full sun, that bed probably gets like six to seven hours just because I don't get great sun here at my house. And so my encouragement to you is that don't worry so much about having a spot that gets eight hours or a spot that gets four hours, but rather focus on finding the area that gets the most sun in your yard and then put it in that area. And so that's gonna kind of give some of that like really precious real estate to those garlic cloves that we're gonna be planting. And so if you're on the newer side to growing garlic, all that you need to take from this portion is just plant your garlic in an area that gets a lot of sun. And then if you are on the kind of more experienced side of growing garlic or just gardening for that matter, you might be wondering, well, like, I don't want to give away that precious real estate. What can I plant it alongside? And so for anybody that's looking to do a little bit of companion planting, this guide from West Coast Seed, their companion planting guide is absolutely incredible. All that you need to do to find it is search West Coast Seeds companion planting guide. And then that's going to be the second search result that shows up. Either I think Mandy or Mike will be able to pop that link into the chat function here, but it's going to walk you through exactly which plants grow as companions for garlic, and then which ones only grow um, kind of as a competitor to garlic that we wouldn't want to be putting alongside it. So for those, again, that are on the more experienced side, you can go ahead and start doing some companion planting, getting your tomatoes, your basil built in there with the garlic. But if you're on the newer side, then just go ahead and get it into a sunny location. So we now know that we're looking to get our garlic into one of those sunny areas. Well, when do we get it into the ground? When do I plant my garlic? And so folks, we are on the absolute eve of garlic planting season. It is hands down, in my opinion, the second most exciting time of the year. Most exciting time being garlic harvest season, which happens a little bit later on. We're gonna get there, don't you worry. But garlic planting season, it truly is a season. It's not one specific date that we need to be nailing. And so it really ranges from anywhere in early October to mid-November. 
depending on where you live. So once again, some of you that are in warmer locations, you're going to go ahead and want to be planting your garlic, um, you know, a little bit uh, earlier or a little bit later on, a little bit closer to mid November. But then those of you that are in cooler locations, you're going to want to go ahead and plant that on the earlier side of October there. And what you're going to do is you're going to plant that before the ground has frozen. And so if you wanna kind of get a bit of a feel for this, all that you need to do is just put um, kind of into Google the name of your city and first frost. And then you're gonna find out when that first frost is happening in your city. And then once you figure that out, you can go kind of like one to two weeks ahead of that. But once again, we do have a really good sized window anywhere from beginning of October to end of November. And you're gonna have the opportunity to get those really beautiful heads of garlic. And so the last piece on that front is that if you do want to plant on the exact same date as me and a whole bunch of folks throughout our community, we're gonna be planting on October 15th, smack dab in the middle between the two there. And so um, what we're gonna be doing is, is planting it on that day. But if you do want to um, plant with us, then just utilize the hashtag garlic gang, tag us on social there. And then we're gonna be kind of seeing everything that everybody is planting all across basically Canada, the US and into Europe at this point as well there. All righty. So garlic planting season, that is happening over the course of the fall. And so that really brings us into the next area here. And one second, I'm just gonna turn the audio off on Mandy's here. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just. Sorry, here. There we go. Okay, perfect. Got that squared away there. So the next piece is that we know that we're going to be planting our garlic around. Uh, and Mandy, I'm just going to shut the uh, video off on, on your end there just because it keeps on uh, popping up a little bit there, but we should be all good now. And so what we're going to do is begin kind of discussing prepping the soil. And so when it comes to prepping the soil, this is where we have this beautiful window between right now in kind of like mid September until mid October. And so we're going to be, you know, patient in terms of getting our garlic into the ground, but we do want to begin getting that soil ready because this is one of the absolute critical elements when it comes to having amazing garlic. And so when it comes to soil from just like a general perspective, the way that I want you to think about it is as a bank account. As our garlic grows, it is going to be making withdrawals from that soil bank in the form of nutrients. It's gonna be pulling out nitrogen, it's gonna be pulling out phosphorus, it's gonna be pulling out potassium as it puts on all that beautiful growth. But as it does that, the soil bank account, it starts to get depleted. So the question to each and every one of us as a gardener is what investments and what deposits are we making into our soil bank in order to set our garlic babies up for success? And so on that front there, there are three key pillars. We use organic compost, we use worm castings, and we utilize an organic fertilizer. And I'm gonna walk you through exactly how to utilize each of these for growing garlic over the course of the season, because we use them at different points. So beginning with our organic compost, this is an absolutely amazing medium to be growing garlic in. Now, why is that? Well, what does garlic love to grow in? It loves to grow in a medium that has lots of nutrients. And when we think about compost, this is organic matter. It's banana peels, it's coffee grounds, it's eggshells, etc. And as those get broken down, nutrients become available for the plant. In this instance, a clove and then head of garlic. So compost, it's getting them a whole bunch of nutrients. But on top of that, it is a really nice and loose medium. When you think about the particle size of compost, it's much, much, much larger than sand or than clay. And so as a result of that, it's really easy for that bulb beneath the surface to grow nice and large and for those roots to spread in every which direction. And then the last piece in terms of compost is that there's one kind of very common thing or issue that occurs with growing garlic. And that is that sometimes folks will end up in a situation where the garlic is sitting in too much water and it ultimately rots out. 
But with compost, it's this beautiful medium where it retains a really, really great amount of moisture. But because the particle size is so big is that once it is like fully at its point, cannot hold any more moisture, that water just begins to run off into the rest of the garden, into the yard, et cetera. It doesn't pool in that area. And so you're gonna have a much lower likelihood of losing any of that garlic when you're planting in a high compost environment. So what does this look like actually bringing it into practice over the course of between now and October 15th? Well, what I would be doing is adding one to two inches of compost into the bed that I'm going to be planting my garlic into. So all that I do is I grab my wheelbarrow there and then I dump a whole bunch of new fresh compost into that bed. And then I'm just using my shovel to spread it around and get that all nicely kind of spread out to the point where it's again one to two inches across that bed. And then just like that folks, this bed, I have just made an absolutely wonderful deposit of nutrients into it, whereby it is getting rejuvenated and recharged and ready for those cloves that were getting into the garden. Now I saw that Adrian just asked a question there. Do you still use your 25% vermiculite, 75% compost blend for garlic? And so folks, the background on this, and this really applies to anybody that's looking for an amazing soil blend or anybody that is establishing their garden beds um, and their garlic space, this uh, kind of like period right now between October 15th. And so over the course of this year, I've been really, really fascinated and curious to find out through experiments, what is kind of the best soil for each of the different plants. And so what I did was I took three raised beds in my backyard, took all the soil out and then put in brand new soil into bed number one, bed number two and bed number three. And then I planted the exact same plants into each of these beds. As we can see, we've got basil at the front, radishes next, potatoes after that, and then some tomatoes at the back there. And over the course of this year, I've just been documenting how each and every crop has grown in those different blends there. And so at the end of that, I basically do a little kind of like same thing that we did with the smaller garlic cloves and larger garlic cloves earlier. I put them all on the scale to see which ones did best. And so I just harvested some potatoes out of these beds. I planted three seed potatoes into each one of those beds. And what were the results? Well, in the 100% compost bed, so bed number one was just 100% pure compost. I got 1,711 grams of potatoes from those three seed potatoes that I planted, which is like a pretty solid haul straight out of the gates. So that's a good medium to be going with. Now on the other side, bed number three, that's where I had about 50% compost and 50% native soil. And what I did was I rototilled that into the soil. So it was mixed up into one really nice homogenous blend there. And that resulted in 2,456 grams. So now we're talking about like some serious hauls of potatoes there. And you can see behind on the screen there, how many potatoes came out from just again, three seed potatoes that I planted. But the last one, 75% compost, 25% vermiculite resulted in 3,167 grams of potatoes in that instance. And folks, this blend of 75% compost, 25% vermiculite is working so well on all of the other crops that I have going in that experiment as well. So to Adrian's question, do you use this blend for your garlic? I haven't in the past, but I'm gonna pull all of that soil out and put in 75% compost and 25% vermiculite for this upcoming season, just because it is such a good growing medium there. So that is kind of the soil side. We wanna get a whole bunch of compost in there. And if you need to be establishing a new bed for your garlic, a really safe bet is 75% compost and 25% vermiculite. So this is the kind of version of just kind of building that out. I put the three um, parts of compost in and then the 25% vermiculite on top. I mix that up real good in the wheelbarrow. And then I pop that into the bed there mix it all around real good and then tidy it up. And that bed is all set and ready 
to be planting into. And I can see Pixie Girl saying there, dang, I need to start composting. Um, on our YouTube channel there, if you just look mind and soil compost or hot compost, I've got like an 18 minute video that takes you through step by step how to go about building out your first hot compost pile, which is where I get a lot of my compost from. So folks, that is gonna have your soil in a really great space. And now like we're getting close to being through that fall phase. And so we've got two more pieces that we're going to be touching on when it comes to the fall phase. And then we're gonna take a big deep breath, but we nail these last few pieces. And again, you've got like 80% of the information for growing really amazing garlic. So hang with me here for a couple more minutes. What do we do from a spacing and depth perspective? So now we're kind of like on October 15th, the soil is prepped and we're wanting to get our garlic babies into the ground. The traditional and standard approach to um, garlic from a spacing perspective is six inches. So you can see I'm taking my Hori Hori knife, which has a measuring tape on it. And I'm just measuring over six inches and then going down four inches in depth. So really quite nice and deep. And I just continue along and then I start going lengthwise up the bed once again, six inches in depth there. Or sorry, six inches in, in, in length and then four inches in depth. And the reason why we're going four inches deep is just to help give it a really nice bit of insulation through the winter because they're going to be going into those cooler months there. And so this also got me thinking a little bit though, is that, is that actually the best spacing for garlic? And folks, can you guess what I did this past year? Can you guess it at this point? I ran an experiment. And so with six inch spacing, if we were to take a four foot by eight foot raised bed, which I've kind of drawn up here, what that means is that we can fit 78 cloves of garlic into that bed. But then if we go with something such as six inch off centered spacing, and what that means is that between each of the rows, so you go six inches up and six inches over, right smack dab in the middle, we're planting another clove, an off centered clove. And when we do that, we end up getting a first additional row, second additional row, third, fourth, five additional rows. So now within the same four foot by eight foot raised bed, we can be growing 138 cloves. But is that too tight? Is that not enough space? Do they begin to compete with one another? Well, again, as I mentioned, I ran this as an experiment. And so what I found when I harvested them all out was that for the six inch spacing, that came out to 52 grams per head. That was kind of the average size of those ones. But then when we grab our ones that were on six inch off centered spacing, that came out to 41 grams per head. So it was a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit too tight. However, because we went from 78 cloves planted to 138 cloves planted, the total harvest side for six inch spacing was 4,056 grams. And for the six inch off centered spacing was 5,658 grams. And so for those of you that have been on a couple of these happy hours and that follow us on our different social accounts, you know that a big thing that I share is that there is not a right way to garden and a wrong way to garden, but rather many different approaches. And it's all about finding what makes you happiest and what you're most excited about. And so as you lead into this upcoming garlic planting season, if you wanna get those huge honking heads of garlic, go with six inch spacing. If you want to maybe be getting a little bit more harvest, a little bit more total yield out of your garden, maybe you got a family, more mouths to feed, then going with six inch off-centered spacing and getting a little bit more volume could be a really great option. If at this point you're just like, Jordan, your shirt is a little bit out of control and I can't handle all this, I'm going with four inch off-centered spacing, then go with four inch off-centered spacing. But let me know how it goes because I love experiments and I wanna know how it works out for you. All that to say, folks, Six inch spacing is gonna work great for you. Six inch off-centered spacing, that's gonna give you a little bit more volume. Do the one that ultimately excites you most, brings you the most joy, the most happiness. And so with that said, last piece that we're gonna to touch on before we pause for a moment is just getting those clothes into the ground. And this is where we come back to that soil bank. Again, we've put our compost in, we've made our first deposit to set our garlic babies up for an amazing season. It's time for us to make our next deposit. And so on that front, we're going to use our worm castings. So you can see them in my hand here. And what we're going to do is we're gonna put about a half handful into each one of the holes that we've dug. So all that I'm doing now is I'm going to each one of those holes 
and I'm popping those worm castings in there. Worm castings are really like mother nature's fertilizers and in a lot of ways like mother nature's miracle. And so what's happening here is that that compost that we put in there, the one to two inches, that's organic matter. And as it gets broken down, those nutrients are gonna become available for our plant babies. And so with the worm castings, this is also compost, but it's gone through the digestive tract of a worm. And as it does that, it gets coated with all these enzymes and bacteria and microbes that are so, so, so beneficial for plants. So when we get that now into the soil, they go to work on breaking down all that compost, freeing up the nutrients for the garlic babies. A tag team absolutely made in heaven. So we've got our worm castings in there. Now it's time to get our cloves into the ground. This is kind of like one of the final moments here. All that we do is we pop the clove in four inches deep. And so as you can see, I'm just going in, popping it four inches deep, and then just putting a little bit of soil over top, just covering it with the surrounding soil. Easy peasy. And it's a little bit tough to see in that video, but here is a really nice clove of garlic. And when you're planting them, you want to do it with the pokey end facing up. And then with the kind of like flat end facing down, that's where the roots are going to come out of. And this is where the main stem is going to grow out of. So pokey end facing up the most technical explanation that I'm going to give this evening. And so the last thing that we do on October 15th, before we kick back, knowing that our babies have everything that they need to absolutely thrive, is that we put down a leaf mulch. So what you're gonna do is rake up a whole bunch of leaves, and then you can put down anywhere from two, three, or four inches of leaf mulch onto that bed there. So I've got them there, and then I just spread them out nicely to completely cover that bed. This is adding a little bit more insulation to give them that highest likelihood of surviving through the winter. But on top of that, it's also keeping it a little bit warmer for those microbes to continue to work in those top few inches of soil to break down as much of that compost and free up nutrients for our garlic babies. Folks, You've done it. You have made it to the end of the fall portion of growing garlic. You are 80% there. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pause here for a moment. Um, I'm just going to dive into the chat function here to see uh, what's all going on, what's being chatted through. And then um, if you have any questions right now, feel free to fire one or two of those in. And then at the very end of our session, I'm going to answer any questions that come through. I'm happy to stay online for as long as needed but I'm gonna spend a minute or two. It's also a great time to fill up your snack bowl before we dive into the really fun part, which is the spring growth phase and summer harvest phase. All right. Uh, great question from uh, Seibel there. What are you all doing with the wonderful burlap sacks that the worm castings come in? I personally, I store my dahlia tubers in there. I store potatoes in there. I store uh, garlic in there as well. And then one thing that I'm doing right now is I actually have a few of our burlap sacks over top of my sunflowers so that the birds can't get to the seeds on those. So I can save some of those seeds, harvest off the head and then save those seeds. Um, so I end up putting them to use in a whole bunch of other areas. I would love to know in the chat what other folks are doing with their burlap sacks there. Great question from Meg here. What's the best way to store worm castings over the winter? Uh, we are worm composting for the first time. So if you have an actual worm farm, bring it inside. You don't want it to freeze. And if you have just like a bag of worm castings from us, if you want to kind of like do the absolute best thing, I would say actually dump it out into a tote and put some wet um, newspaper over top of it so that there's moisture in there at all times. That'll keep the microbes firing away in there. Great question from Carly here. Can you still plant in part shade? Carly, I love this question so much. And so when it comes to planting garlic and any crops out there, just know that like more sun is better, but less sun does not mean that you can't plant it. So if there's a crop that you're really excited about, like garlic or like tomatoes or like peppers that grow best in kind of like a full sun environment and you don't have full sun, still plant it. I personally believe that it is way better to plant plants that you're going to love, be excited about, see how they grow in even a less than ideal environment than planting something that is gonna be like a low sun plant that you're just not excited about. And what actually ends up happening is that you have to work maybe a little bit harder, but it allows you to get to know that plant even more in depthly or more intimately. And then when you at a later point in life are living somewhere with full sun, 
all of these learnings are unlocked because then you got the power of the sun coming down on it at eight, 10, 12 hours per day. So absolutely still plant garlic in a part sun environment if that is a crop that you're really excited about. Okay. Uh, Bruce and Laura Hanson, do you use alpha pellets as fertilizer? The only three things that I use are organic compost, our worm castings and our 444 super food. Um, all the, the last of those two, which do come in the garlic kit, which we're going to chat about at the end of this session here. Great question on the leaves front here. So kind of like, are there any leaves that you can't put into the garden that you wouldn't want to be utilizing? What about pine needles? Um, this is one where I'm only going to speak to my experience because I've heard online that there's some plant or some leaves that you wouldn't want to be getting into your garden beds. Um, because of what they would release. And I personally, I just go to like the baseball park where the baseball fields are. I rake up a whole bunch of leaves and I bring those home and I pop those onto each and every one of my beds. So it isn't something that I've had any like concern over or that I've um, you know, ran into any issues on or that I've been specific about like not bringing home a certain type of leaf. But that's just my like one personal experience. I'm not too stressed, too concerned about it. Um, but that could vary for, for other folks for sure. All right, I think I'll answer one more and then we will continue along. Ooh, this is a good one. What about seaweed instead of leaves? So Al Soon, awesome question there. This is one that I have not done myself, but I was messaging with one of the individuals in our community and they shared that they did cover with seaweed last year and it ended up growing really well. Um, I believe that they did a little bit of an AB experiment, leaves versus seaweed, and the seaweed grew a little bit better, um, but I can't remember that was 100% the case. I do know that both of them did grow well. So if you've got access to seaweed, you wanna try something different, absolutely give it a whirl there. These questions here are amazing that are coming through. Question from Butterfly Zone, 10A has no fall leaves. What's the best option? Straw, go with straw as an option to go over top of those beds. And last piece on that front is if you don't want these blowing away from the wind, what I do is I take landscape fabric and I put that over top of the beds and I put basically like rocks along the landscape fabric so it can't blow away. And then on January 1st, I begin my journey into the spring. First thing that I do is I take that landscape fabric off if there isn't snow on it um, so the babies can push through the surface as they need. Now, folks, what we're going to do is we're going to continue along. Again, we're 75, 80% of the way there. But um, at the very end, I'm going to hang out online here, answer any additional questions that come through. But for right now, what I want to do is dive into the spring time. So let's buckle back in because there's really only like three pieces that we need to touch on when it comes to the spring. You've done the majority of the work. You've done the heavy lifting here in the fall. So the first thing that happens in the spring is that we see our babies poke through the surface. So here we are now in February for myself. And it's just such an awesome moment seeing those babies begin to poke through the surface as I move a little bit of that leaf mulch to the side. Now, this is gonna be a little bit earlier for some of you that are in say the lower mainland in Ladner and in Delta. And this is gonna be later in the year for those of you that are in cooler climates. It's gonna vary anywhere from kind of probably late January all the way through to mid late March, depending on your zone, your region. And as they begin to poke through the surface, we come back to our soil bank and we really want to encourage them into growth mode here. And so what I'm going to do on this front is I'm actually gonna remove that leaf mulch. I'm gonna put that into my composter, but I'm gonna still you know, use those leaves, but just in the compost. And I'm gonna just kind of like free them up so I can see all the babies coming through the surface and begin to get that next feeding into the soil. So here we are, and this is around kind of like early March for me. Once again, doesn't have to be beginning of March, it can be end of March, a um, little bit forgiving in terms of when you can do it on that front. You want to really start thinking about them going into growth phase when they get to the kind of like three or four inches coming out of the soil there. And so what do we do? Well, the first thing that I like to do is I like to put down more worm castings. Again, I really am like, I, I just really believe in kind of like investing in the soil and building that soil bank as much as possible and keeping it simple with these three pieces. So I'm doing about one handful of worm castings around each one of the, or each square foot. So one handful per kind of like square foot of planting. And then I come with our four, four, four superfood. And I do about one tablespoon per square foot. 
one tablespoon per square foot of our 444 superfood. And so I've got that all kind of around each and every one of the plant babies that are coming through the surface there. The last thing that I do is I massage that into the top one inch of soil there. And so I begin to work that in so that they all have um, their worm castings, their organic fertilizer. And now the last thing that I do from a kind of like soil bank deposit or investment perspective is that I took all those leaves off I still want to get a bit of a mulch on there. And so this is where I actually put down another one to two inches of compost. And this is just like the compost that I make myself here at home. It's nice and thick and chunky. And it's doing two things. It's providing more nutrients, but it's also providing more insulation as we go through that first part of spring there. And as you can see, I'm letting all the babies poke through the surface there. I'm not blocking any of them off at this point. And I like a nice and tidy garden. So I'm going through there with my broom <laughs> and getting it all tidied. So folks, that is like the one big key piece that we need to do in the springtime is just really kind of like launch them into growth mode with the worm castings, with the super food, and then with the compost as well there. So now that we've done that, these babies, they have everything that they need. It's time to work in partnership with mother nature and let her bring down all that heat, all that sun. And what happens over the course of the coming three to four months these babies take off. So they're going to put on three to four feet of growth over the course of March, April, May. And whereby at this point, we're at kind of probably late May here, they are a huge, beautiful plant. And once again, the beauty of garlic here is that like we only had to spend maybe an hour on one day in March taking off that leaf mulch putting down the worm castings, the super food and the compost. It's like, honestly, one of the absolute best kind of like entry level or like kind of like intro to gardening crops to grow. And just so kind of like rewarding getting to then harvest the big and beautiful heads in just a few months time. Speaking of folks, we're into the home stretch here. We've made it through the spring. It is into the final chapter that we have here together. And that is all around when do we go about harvesting? And this is, once again, it's going to vary for each of us, depending on if you're somewhere a little bit warmer, somewhere a little bit cooler. But there are two things that each and every one of us can be looking for to know when it is time to harvest our garlic. So the very first thing that we want to look for as a sign that they're getting close to being ready to harvest are the garlic scapes. So growing out of the top of the plant is going to be this garlic scape here that's gonna grow up and then do a little loop-de-woo twirl and shoot out the other end. And it's gonna be kind of pokey on that end. And there's gonna be a very distinct kind of growth or bulge here. And this is where new garlic seeds would grow from if we left this on the plant. The challenge for us wanting to be growing big, beautiful heads beneath the surface is that the plant is kind of uh, directing a ton and a ton of energy to developing this when it's left on the plant. And that's energy that is not going into developing the heads beneath the surface. And so what we actually want to do is we harvest our garlic scapes. You're gonna take a pair of pruning shears and you're gonna cut it like right down here on the far right hand side of the screen. And let me show you a video of that. So this is probably gonna be at some point in mid June, we go out to our garlic, we see them. And again, just taking the pruning shears going down and chopping it off. And then I just go from one plant to the next there, chopping them all off. And I like to cut them as close as I can to the last set of foliage or of leaves that are coming off of that main stem. And folks, the beautiful part about growing garlic is that these garlic scapes are edible. You get to enjoy your first meal from the garlic that you've planted with these garlic scapes. They're a little bit of like a more mild garlicky flavor. And a lot of folks will create a pesto with them. You could grill them up on this uh, barbecue. You could put them into a stir fry. But this past year, I actually, I really enjoy Middle Eastern food. And I'm not sure if anybody's had like a doner or falafel wrap. And it has like that garlicky paste, creamy kind of sauce in the middle of it called garlic tomb. And that's made with garlic cloves. But I was like, it's a little bit intense from a flavor perspective. I wonder if with garlic scapes, it would actually be dialed back a little bit because they're a bit more mild. And so I started playing around and put together what is one of the recipes that I am most proud of, which is a garlic scape 
tomb. If you want to have a really delicious kind of like garlicky spread to be putting onto pizza, to be putting onto a sandwich, to be putting onto potatoes, this is an absolute winner. Um, we've got a full video on how to go about doing it on our YouTube channel there. So come June, you're going to be able to get those garlic shapes into a tomb if you would like. Everybody that knows that's tried it this year has been like, this is incredibly, incredibly good. So we've cut all the garlic scapes off. We are into the very last thing that we're looking for, the second piece to determine when it's time to harvest our garlic. And that is that we want to wait until four of the leaves have died back. So don't harvest your garlic until four of the leaves on each of those stems have died back. And if you're looking at your garden and you know some of them are at four, but some of them are still at three, wait until those ones that are still only at three dead leaves are at four, even if it means that the other ones get to five or six. You can definitely, you've got some kind of like leniency on letting them stay in there a little bit longer. And they're just gonna be putting more energy into developing that head. So it's best to uh, harvest a little bit later than a little bit earlier. So much of the magic is happening in those last kind of like three to four weeks. So when we look at this stem right here, we can see dead leaf number one, dead leaf number two, dead leaf number three, and dead leaf number four. Folks, each and every one of you that has been on the session here, you now have all the information, all the knowledge that you need to have no longer the second best day of the year, the first best day of the year, garlic harvesting day. And I know that for each and every one of you, if you follow these steps, you're going to have really beautiful garlic coming out of your garden, looking just like this one that I harvested. So all that you need to do, just grab your hori hori knife, pop it under, and I'm gonna leave the audio on so you can hear the roots. <laughs> Look at that there. So all that you're doing is grabbing your hori hori knife, going really deep underneath that garlic baby to kind of pop those roots. Because as you can see, like, if we grow in a really high compost medium, those roots are going to sprawl and the head that's coming out of it is going to be absolutely honking. When we look at that one right there, it ended up being like quite literally the size of my hand there. So these are the types of garlic that I was getting out of my garden last year. And when it comes back to like individuals that were in your shoes last year, take a look at what Kathy had to say. I followed Jordan's how to grow garlic episode to a T. I ordered the garlic kit and went to work. I measured, I prepped the soil, I planted, I did exactly what he suggested, did a little 444 early spring and I planted 75 bulbs. And of that, only two didn't produce, 73 for 75. That's dang good, truly amazing. As you can see, and as I say to my family and friends, I think we nailed our garlic growing. So very, very happy with the product along with the instruction from Jordan. I'll continue to process every year, continue this process every year. So folks, again, each and every one of you have all of the knowledge, all the information that you need at this point. Um, to put this presentation together has been about 11 months of work for me because I had to record all of the beginnings of the experiments. Um, so really, really just appreciate all of your time and attention here. And then for any of you that do want to utilize our garlic kit, right? If you don't want to go out and have to find your red Russian garlic, go to another place to find your worm castings, go to another place to find your organic fertilizer, we will ship that garlic kit directly to your door so that you have everything that you need to be growing garlic just like Kathy did here. And the exact same things that I'm utilizing in my garden. And on top of that, what we are doing is that we are paying for your shipping. So free shipping on the first 100 orders that come through our website here for our garlic kits. And what's included in that are two bags of our worm castings, one bag of our 444 superfood, and three heads of red Russian hardneck garlic. Mike and I were literally out picking all that up earlier this week, going through and grabbing the absolute best heads that we could find there for you by hand ourselves. And then once we ship that to you, seven days later, you're getting an email from me with step-by-step -step video guides so that you can be refreshed at every point through the season on exactly what to be doing and what to be keeping an eye out for. So that is what's included in the standard garlic kit. But remember those jumbo cloves, 
that's the only thing that I'm planting this year. I'm planting exclusively jumbo cloves. So if you want to get your hands on some of these jumbo cloves that I have right behind me here, you can do a pack of 10 add on. And what I will say on that front is that we had about 90, 95 of them originally. Um, we've already sold a whole bunch of those. So there are only 56 of those packs of 10 jumbo cloves still remaining on our website. And then there's also the option to add on the Hori Hori knife. And so to get yours, all that you need to do is right below me in this video, there is a link over to our website. I think Mandy or Mike is going to go ahead and pop that into the chat function here. So you can head over to our website, grab either the garlic kit or grab one with the jumbo cloves add-on or the Hori Hori knife add-on, and then use the code garlic gang 2023 at checkout to get your free shipping. And last amazing piece on that front is that we do also a hundred percent money back guarantee. So you don't have a dang thing to be worrying about. I don't want any stress in your life. I don't want any worry in your life. I just want you to be enjoying the garden, taking as much of the guesswork out of it as possible. So that is the way to get your hands on one of our garlic kits. And again, it's free shipping for the first hundred orders that we receive here. Folks, that is everything that I wanted to cover off on for today. Thank you all so much for joining here. And you know what? I'm just going to hang out here for a little bit. So if you want to start um, signing off, you're more than welcome to. But if you've got questions or if you want to see any of the questions from other individuals, go ahead and start firing those into the chat function. And I'll be more than happy to get those uh, answered here. Question from Corey, can we just buy garlic? Yes, you can buy packs of 10, just the jumbo cloves on the website. Um, and once you order three of those, that's going to get you the free shipping as well. So put three rounds of that into your cart and you'll get free shipping on that there. Uh, from Beverly there, is it 10 heads or 10 cloves? It's 10 cloves. So literally yesterday evening, I went through 150 jumbo heads of garlic broke them all down to get the 900 biggest honking cloves of garlic, removed all the smaller ones. Um, and then those come in packs of 10 for you. So that's gonna be 10 cloves of just jumbo garlic that you're getting on that front. All right. Question from uh, Stepanka. I'm not sure if I pronounced that properly. Amazing question. Where to store your garlic after harvesting? Great uh, kind of point there. I, I intentionally didn't put that in just because I didn't want to overwhelm too much with the amount of information. But once you've harvested your garlic, you want to put it somewhere that is nice and dry. So you don't want to do anything with it for about 14 days. You pull it out of the ground, leave all the dirt on there, put it somewhere nice and dry, such as your garage for 14 days. Even more ideal is if you hang it upside down, let the gravity pull a little bit of that moisture down into the stem there. Um, and then after 14 days, you can chop off all the roots and then you can chop off the top portion, the neck of the garlic as well there. And then pop it into say one of the burlap sacks that the worm castings come in for storage over the course of the winter. And as you can see Mandy mentioned there for better long-term storage, cure them for two weeks, amazing. And that answers Sandy's question as well there, I believe. Brianna, wonderful. We're getting that garlic kit out to you straight away. We're shipping everything out beginning of next week there. Um, question from Meg here. Where would you suggest purchasing compost in Squamish? Um, so Meg, I actually am a fan of what comes from coast aggregates. A lot of people say like awful things about it, but what I do that's maybe a little bit different is that I sift it. So I then sift, I run all of it through a half inch sift because I find that it's a little bit woody when you buy it just from them. And so I run it all through a half inch sift. It gets all the bigger pieces of wood out. And then I use that just pure, beautiful organic compost. And that's an Omri organic certified um, compost that you're getting there. That's what I personally go with. A little bit of work, but saves me having to drive down to the city, anything along those lines. Uh, Corey, you can absolutely leave your worm castings just in the bag that they're in um, and just leave that in like a garage, again, just like a cool dark place and they'll be all good for the season. Question from Arian, do you harvest all your varieties the same way? That's what I would do for all the hard neck varieties. Um, don't know on the soft neck because they don't have the garlic scapes that come off them. All right. Ron, thank you so much. Love that. 
Uh, garlic rust, that's one that I haven't encountered myself, Bruce and, and Laura there. Um, I believe that is a bacterial disease that's happening in the soil there. Um, Mandy's shedding a little bit of light on it, but I know that like Jason and Colleen, they're mentioning that they, I think have had some in the past and they were able to spray it off. So it didn't actually have any impact on the head of garlic that they were growing. But again, from my perspective and my experience, um, growing in that really, really high compost environment where you got so much microbial life happening. For me, it hasn't resulted in any issues in terms of uh, ongoing pests or diseases where I'd need to start rotating crops. I just grow everything in the exact same beds as I grew them in the previous year, if I had success in that area. Holly, have you tried growing from the garlic scape uh, bubbles? Uh, totally butchered that. Uh, two-year process, I believe. I believe it is at least a two-year process. And again, those are going to be like really small clothes even after two years. I am a little bit curious to try it just to like fully learn that side. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to grab one real quick because I think I've got some in the garage. Give me one second. Alrighty, so as you can see here, this, oh, it's so it's like a little popcorn kernel. So this came from the garlic scape. That is what is growing in that garlic scape there. And you put that in the ground, it's gonna start going in the direction of becoming garlic. But then this, as an example, so this is, this is one of the jumbo cloves. So you can see the difference there. So ultimately, after many, many years and good growing conditions, this little teeny tiny baby here will end up looking something more like this. That's why I'm kind of curious to try it is I'm just like, I wonder how big I can grow from an actual little bubble there. Again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly. Bubble, bubble, something along those lines. Okay, great question from Jay Sorn. Do you rotate from year to year? This is a really good question. I don't practice any crop rotation myself. So I grow in the exact same place every single season, um, unless I'm noticing a recurring or ongoing disease or pest to that plant, but I haven't noticed that yet. So what I really like maximize for is finding the best place for that plant to grow. And then if it grows well there, I leave it in that area. Um, Crop rotation, it is something that comes from like larger agriculture practices where individuals are farming on several acres and they don't have the ability from like a soil bank perspective to be adding compost, to be adding worm castings, to be adding organic fertilizer to that bed or that, you know, several acres year over year. They need to give it multiple years and be rotating the crops to help get different nutrients back into the soil. But in a backyard environment, we can amend all of those beds each and every year with a little bit of compost, worm castings and organic fertilizer. So for myself, I'm like, if my tomatoes grow really well here and my garlic grows really well here, I'm not going to waste a year of moving them into an area they won't grow well. I'm just going to amend that bed, get it really just like topped right back up and then continue to grow and have a lot of success in it. And thank you so much. Yeah, the chat has been absolutely flying this evening here. Great question from Sonia. How often do you water the garlic? So Sonia, I watered my garlic this year, a grand total of zero times. And I didn't touch on this in the presentation because it is going to vary so much for us depending on where you're growing. And so for myself, it was like a super wet, super cold spring here in um, the Pacific Northwest. And so I didn't water my garlic a single time. The previous year though, I was watering probably close to like every other day um, for about 30 minutes off of my irrigation because it was so hot in June and so hot in July. And even in May, it was fairly warm. So when it comes to watering your garlic, um, and we do have a full video on our YouTube channel on how to go about watering your garlic. And the kind of like rule of thumb on that front is to dig down two inches. If when you dig down two inches, it's still moist and nice and like dark to the touch and moist uh, on, on your fingers there, then you don't need to water it yet. But if you dig down two inches and it's dry um, and it's kind of like a lighter, more milk chocolate brown, then it is time to give it a really nice and big drink of water. So that's what you wanna be looking for. And as you go through the season, you're gonna to begin to notice like, okay, you know, I. 
watered three days ago. It's been sunny the last three days and fairly warm. I know that I need to give my babies another round of watering today. You're going to figure that out as you go, but using that kind of like rule of thumb of going down two inches to fight uh, to determine whether or not it's dry or not is a really, really good practice. Uh, question there, is there a code for ordering online for free shipping? It should already be applied, but if you look on the screen here, it says garlic gang 2023. Um, and that is uh, the code that you will use to get free shipping on the garlic kit there. Uh, question from Elisa here. Will it store for longer if you leave the next on it like you have braided it? Um, I don't know definitively. I want to say no, um, that it's best to chop off the, uh, the, 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 the neck of the garlic there, but I can't say that definitively, but that's what I personally do with mine there. I think a lot of folks, when they, they braid it, they kind of leave it there for two, three weeks and then they chop it all off. But again, I can't say that definitively. <laughs> Thank you, Shauna. Appreciate it so much. Another question here from Ron. Are you supposed to stop watering for two weeks before the harvest? Yeah. So if, um, if you're coming off of like a wet spring, um, and where, where the plant has been getting a lot and a lot of water, you definitely want to cut that watering over the course of the last two weeks. And the rationale behind this is that that's basically just introducing more stress to the plant. And it's at this point, those last few weeks that we actually want the plant to be experiencing stress because then it's gonna just keep on putting all of its energy down into developing that head. So once you cut the garlic scapes off, usually it's about three to four weeks until those four leaves have died off. And so maybe a week to two weeks after cutting your garlic scapes, you could cut off all the watering as well. That's what I did two years ago, 2021, when it was a really hot year. Okay. All right, question from Chris here. My Italian neighbor uses his urine as a fertilizer. Sounds gross, but his garden is epic. Would you recommend this as a natural and economic nitrogen source? Um, absolutely, this is a very common um, uh, practice. Uh, totally blanking on the word right now. Um, but it's, yeah, not like a like re regenerative slash restorative practice, but when you're going from like, you know, just using kind of from like the waste cycle, um, using something like human urine in your compost pile, not directly into the beds, but do it into your compost pile is a very, very common practice there. Um, so that, that is something that, yeah, like is um, tried, trusted and true. Give it a whirl. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Joe, Joe, great to have you online here. Um, and yeah, she's mentioning the same thing in terms of actually intentionally cutting off the watering to introduce stress to a plant. Um, very common to do that with pepper plants as well there. Alrighty, folks. Well, I think we've gotten through all of the questions here. Perfect. Uh, so question from uh, Sonny there, how many heads of garlic will the kit give me? Um, you should be expecting probably like 15 to 18 heads of garlic from the red Russian that you get there. Red Russian is one of those ones where there's fewer cloves on the heads, but they're larger heads um, that you end up growing. And so that's where if you add on the 10 jumbo cloves, um, then you're gonna be more in like that 25 to 30 range, which is super, super great. Um, and then like, by all means, you can augment that by adding even more garlic into the mix or different varieties as well. And then over time that just begins to accumulate, right? So last year I grew about 130 heads of garlic. Um, and what I'll be doing is only planting jumbo garlic this coming year. And I'm going to increase that to around 200 cloves. That I'm going to be getting into the ground. Uh, question from Catherine here. How long do you pre-soak the cloves? I don't do any pre-soaking myself, um, but could be something that'd be worthwhile trying, I suppose. Yeah, Lisa, I'd say that the like on, on Red Russian, the average is probably five to six um, really good sized cloves that you come off there. I do get some that end up, you know, in the more like eight to nine range, but I'd say the average is, is five to six. And if it does end up eight to nine, they're like much kind of like smaller, almost like closer to slivers, um, but a higher volume of them.
All righty, folks. Well, I think that just about does it here. A uh, question from Karen, how you measure vermiculite to get proportions, correct volume or grams. Um, so I don't do it on a like a grams basis. I just grab five gallon pails and I fill three of those up with compost. And I grab the fourth pail and I fill that up with vermiculite. And then I mix that in a wheelbarrow or sometimes I'll just put that directly into a bed um, and then just mix it up directly in the bed there. Oh, Lisa, I was wondering if this question was going to come through. Did you taste test the flavor? I have not yet taste tested how much different a jumbo clove tastes than a regular size clove, but this question has come up from a lot of people. I think I might do like a fear factor Instagram reel or YouTube short where I taste test a small clove or a regular clove versus a jumbo clove. So keep your eyes peeled for that. I'm already dreading it, but I think it's, you know, it's, it's a question that's come up quite a bit. So I, I should have the answer to it. All righty. And I think there was one more that I saw there. Uh, Linda, I cannot see where the 10 cloves are listed. Hey, Linda, I'm going to be uh, on our website on the chat function. So if you head over to our website on the bottom right hand corner, there should be a little chat icon. Just send a message through there and I'll help you out with getting those added into your cart there and we'll get it all squared away. Alrighty, folks, I think we are all done and dusted here. Thank you all so much for the amazing just kind of like comments all throughout and the questions to the end here. Um, like I said, it's, you know, really 10 to 11 months worth of work putting this presentation together and passing along all of the learnings, all the knowledge that I can to try and help each and every one of you out. So I really, again, just appreciate all of the engagement and enthusiasm from all of you over the course of the hour here. Um, if you have any questions on how to be getting your orders in, again, head over to the website. I'm gonna be live on our chat function there for the rest of the evening, and I'll be able to help you out. Other than that, folks, let's get that garlic in the ground October 15th and have an awesome one. You, chat with you all later.